ValveTime.net. Hi, and welcome to the Valve Time News. Each week, we'll bring you the biggest talking points regarding Valve and the community. Now, the news. After Michael Abrash and many other members of Valve's virtual reality hardware team moved to Oculus VR earlier this year, we more or less assumed Valve would be scaling down their efforts, but it would appear that isn't quite the case. Earlier this week, Reddit user JohnUmph provided some interesting details about Valve's own VR prototype after experiencing it at Boston-based VR Jam last weekend. The prototype, shown here, is the same one which made a big splash during the Steam Dev Days conference in January, providing low persistence and a very high frame rate while using its camera system for extremely accurate and natural tracking. This is really the first chance we've had to check out what the prototype actually looks like, and it's pretty impressive. An album contained within John Omp's Reddit post also shows various individuals trying out the headset and a room shot showing what appears to be a talk led by none other than Valve's Chet Falizek. We just don't exactly know what he's talking about. As John Omp describes, the headset was running the same test demo previously shown at Steam Dev Days, which features various scripted set pieces including models of Atlas and or Peabody from Portal 2 and a bunch of high quality DX11 particle simulators. While this is all well and good, we've kind of heard it all before. That is, we've heard most of it before. The original post released by John Omph, which we managed to screenshot here, discussed a bunch of VR modes for Dota 2 which were offhandedly mentioned by Valve's team. The post has since been updated twice, once to remove the discussion of the modes and once more to explain that they were mentioned as simply being experiments and demos, not actual upcoming features. The demos in question include a board-like game setup which allows the user to bend down and inspect parts of the map from any angle. Another involves a life-size Dota 2 VR experience which lets spectators hang out in the middle of a lane at ground level as heroes and creeps fight it out, something which was quote, very scary. Neither of these demos were shown at the game jam and it's pretty clear Valve's team aren't entirely happy that everyone knows about them, given how much John Omph has had to retract. But it's interesting nonetheless, and we hope we will be able to see them implemented one day. If you're looking to check out all of the juicy technical details for yourself, feel free to head on over to the Reddit thread via the link provided in the video description. Similar links related to every other topic we're going to be discussing this week will also be included, so be sure to check them out. Speaking of Oculus, Oculus VR announced a number of new employees this past week, many of which have significant experience in the video game industry at publishers and developers including EA, Google, 343 Industries, Bungie, and you guessed it, Valve. We obviously don't cover everyone Oculus hires from Valve, but we decided to mention it this once because of who specifically had been hired. The list released by Oculus includes numerous ex-Valve employees such as Jason Holtman, Neil Conazin, Paul Papera, Aaron Nichols, and Matt Alderman. While not every one of these have recently left Valve, several of them have, and our attention was drawn to Jason Holtman and Paul Papera in particular. Holtman was previously one of the major driving forces behind the Steam platform, left Valve in February 2013 before briefly joining Microsoft later that year, a position he left in February 2014 after only six months. While it is neat to see someone like Holtman become the head of platform at Oculus VR, we think you'll be a lot more interested in this next story. You see, we've been snooping, and Paul Papera, who worked as an artist at Valve for just over a year after leaving 343 Industries, recently updated his LinkedIn profile to describe the work he undertook while at the company. This is where it gets interesting as Papera lists Team Fortress 2 and an unannounced project, under the games he worked on. Now, while this could mean quite literally anything, it should be noted that Papera was previously listed inside the Half-Life 3 mailing list on Valve's Jira network. <laughs> But it further confirms that development of Half-Life 3 is very much underway somewhere within Valve. If nothing else, hopefully this small tidbit of new info will help silence the naysayers who pointlessly go on about how Valve apparently don't make video games anymore. In somewhat related news, a new Steam client beta update released earlier this week introduced Steam VR support for the Linux and Mac OS X operating systems. While obviously still in beta, the new update should allow you Oculus owners out there to enjoy Steam VR on a larger range of computers. So enjoy! In Dota 2 news, a new game update released on Monday introduced the 6.81b balance patch. 
The patch, like all balance patches, has introduced some rather significant changes for numerous heroes and items in order to fine-tune the game's metagame ahead of the International 2014 in mid-July. While too numerous to count here, the changes mainly affect heroes picked or banned significantly through the international qualifiers in May, including reduced minimum stun duration and damage output for the Sacred Arrow, weaker damage per pulse for Treant Protector's Leech Seed, and halved bonus damage on creeps when using Batrider's Sticky Napalm. Multiple other heroes were also affected, so be sure to check out the official changelog for yourself to find out how your favorite character may have been affected. The balance patch wasn't the only thing implemented, however, as the update also added three compendium rewards previously unlocked by the ever-expanding prize pool. The alternate voice pack and model update votes were both unlocked alongside the Daily Hero Challenge, which randomly selects a hero for a player before providing 25 compendium points should they win in a single match as that hero. All of these newly released rewards can now be accessed via their respective pages within the compendium itself. Valve are going to want to hurry if they want to catch up, however, as this week saw the international prize pool surpass two new stretch goals, namely the customizable multi-kill banner and the after-party broadcast at the 8.4 and 8.8 .8 million marks, respectively. Over the weekend, the prize pool surpassed a total of 9 million, which means at the current rate of growth, the ultimate 10 million goal should be surpassed in around a week or so. With over a month until the International 2014 even begins, it remains to be seen if Valve will attempt to add even more stretch goals. Only time will tell, but we'll be sure to let you know if they do. Oh, and one last thing before we move on to talk about something else. If you're a Community Workshop contributor for Dota 2 and you're going to be attending the International 2014, be sure to contact Valve as soon as possible. The Dota 2 team are looking to provide workshop contributors with special themed badges for the event, which will likely have something to do with the electronic signature system introduced last year. If you're a contributor and you're going to be attending, contact Valve by sending an email to ti-contributors at valvesoftware.com before June 9th, 2014. Now, let's move on. Yet another week has passed without a new update for Team Fortress 2. While the update void is around 6 months wide at this point, it looks as if it will be coming to an end pretty soon, as Valve dropped some pretty big hints this past week. In a new blog post to the TF2 website known as the Manco Factory Floor, Valve mentioned the team is busy working on the latest updates before discussing various rather weird weapon concepts which have been scrapped during development over the past few years. The rather lengthy post covers three scrapped weapon concepts in total, the Big Bomb, the Face Stab Knife, and the Sucker. The Big Bomb, which acted as a replacement for the Demo Man's Sticky Bomb launcher, effectively allowed players to replace many smaller Sticky Mines with one large, more powerful one. According to the post, the weapon wasn't fun to use or be up against as it added spam, but not value, to the battlefield. An interesting note at the end of the discussion mentions that not a single life was lost to the Big Bomb throughout the countless playtests, likely making it the most useless offensive weapon in the history of Team Fortress. Next up is the Face Stab Knife, which as you would imagine replaced the Spy Standard Knife with one that killed opponents instantly from the front rather than from behind. Not only were Valve not confident in the idea to begin with, but it also ended up being just as stupid and frustrating as you would imagine, forcing Valve to quickly drop the idea ahead of 2011's Manco technology update. The final scrapped weapon, known as the Sucker, would have replaced the Pyro's air blast ability with a vacuum of sorts which pulled enemy players closer to the Pyro rather than blasting them farther away. While it does sound kind of neat on paper, potentially allowing Pyros to pull victims further into their deadly flames, it apparently caused some pretty frustrating gameplay issues while also completely ruining the movement prediction system TF2 uses to help manage server connectivity. This problem created extreme visual stuttering and lag, forcing Valve to ultimately drop the idea. Now, that isn't quite everything. While the majority of the post does focus on weapon ideas that were previously scrapped, it sounds as if the final item on the list, a parachute for the soldier known as the Base Jumper, will actually be making it into the game in the next update. As you might imagine, the parachute allows the soldier to remain airborne for a short period after rocket jumping, providing certain position-based advantages at the cost of maneuverability. Adjusting playstyles by adding a benefit and a negative has always been core to keeping almost all TF2 weapons balanced, so we fully understand why Valve would look into including the base jumper in the next update, and we look forward to trying it out for ourselves. However, it remains to be seen if the next update will include the previously teased moon base map or not, so only time will tell. Earlier this week, the Counter-Strike Global Offensive Development Team released a new blog post to the game's website to announce that Operation Phoenix, which was previously scheduled to conclude on June 4th, has been extended for a bit while Valve works on the next operation. 
At this point, pushing back the end date for operations has become something of a tradition, so it's probably for the best if you just expect them to end a week or two after they should, just don't come crying to us if they don't. Anyway, this should give you CSGO fans a little bit of extra time to enjoy all the maps included in Operation Phoenix and to upgrade your Phoenix coins. As usual, we'll be sure to mention when the next operation is announced. While the Steam Controller and Steam Machines project might have been delayed until 2015, that hasn't stopped them from reaching the headlines in the past week. On Wednesday, ASUS revealed the ROG GR8 at Computex 2014, a new console gaming PC which is fully compatible with SteamOS and the Steam Controller. The first iteration of the device will come with Windows 8.1 fully installed, but the official press release from ASUS mentioned that SteamOS-powered version will be launching at a later date in alignment with Valve's Steam Machine schedule. This brings the total number of official Steam Machine partners to 14, meaning those of you who are interested in picking up one will have plenty of choice. No price point has currently been given, but ASUS has mentioned the device features an Intel Core i7 processor and an NVIDIA GTX 750 Ti graphics card capable of running at 4K display resolutions, so don't expect it to be cheap. If you need to get your regular fix of TF2 SFM goodness, we might have a thing to satisfy you for another week. YouTube user No Names Left recently uploaded Hotline Fortress 2 Wrong Number, a minute-long SFM short which, as you might imagine, mixes the two crazy worlds of Hotline Miami and Team Fortress into one beautifully gory video filled with plenty of electronic music and blood. It would be an understatement for us to say it was excellently made, so make sure you check it out. Now, as we mentioned on last week's show, June 1st, 2014 marked eight years since the release of Half-Life 2 Episode 1. While we did celebrate the anniversary with a new episode of A Minute With last weekend, that was merely the first part. Earlier this week, we released the eighth episode of Valve Time Top 5, which we used to count down our top five best moments, and it was a lot of fun to make. We cover a pretty wide range of topics, from puzzle sequences, action set pieces, and narrative arcs, and we're sure you guys will enjoy the episode, so go on ahead and check it out if you haven't already. And if you already have watched it, why not go back and do it again and again? It would make Nick very happy. And that wraps up another week of Valve News. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and uh, follow us on Facebook and Twitter to stay up to date with all the latest. If you like our content, be sure to share this video with your friends and to rate our Dota 2 announcer pack positively over on the Steam Workshop. Enjoy E3 week if you're going to be tuning in. Thanks for watching and bye for now.